So I think I won the, the contest. I got the most, uh, the most buzz buzzwords in my title, except in and the, you know, they are, they are field words that just make the, the name longer. My name is Tiberiu Kovac, short name TB. Um, I've been around for a while. I've done development and I wrote technology advisor because I've done a lot of training, a lot of consulting and not going in and, you know, punching the hours, just helping people understand technology, helping keep people you know, taking the leap, starting with a new programming language, starting with a new framework. And lately what I've done was starting to work as director of technology for a company where I help our customers to move to the cloud. You know, I would have put the digital transformation in the title, you know, how to be nimble and agile when you do digital transformation. I don't think it would have been the right choice of words, although buzz would be enough in there. Um, Microsoft recognized me as a most valuable professional why I have no idea but they think you know I'm worthy the, the award in case you didn't notice so far I'm a geek but you don't know it's I'm a father as well I have two lovely daughters you can find me on Twitter as Tibor19 and if if you put the hashtag go to LDN people will be able to track it and see if there is anything of interest here so of course there won't be any agility discussion without this, you know, the Agile Manifesto. And everybody knows that. If you want, I can give you around 10 minutes to read it. But I'm assuming you already know what's in there. What most of the people forget is, you know, this, the, the footnote, the small thing here. That is while where there is value on the items in the, in the right, we value the items on the left more. And one of the problems I've seen over time, you know, people are just taking stuff out of context. They are just reading and they say, oh, we want working software over comprehensive documentation. And the way they do that, they put a documentation sprint at the end. And of course, the customer doesn't have the money for the documentation. And the customer just gets the, uh, just gets the, the working software, sort of. Uh, or individuals and interaction over processes and tools. How many of you are doing the, you know, the daily stand-up just because someone tells you that you have to do a daily stand-up without actually giving any <laughs> without actually getting any feedback or understanding why do I do that why do you do that and when you ask why there are very few people able to tell you why or you do all the scrum board just because you know someone might walk by and you will look busy you know they will see stuff moving around so although you were not you know you are not uh, trying to stall or anything the value you're bringing is not really a good value. Custo customer collaboration over contract negotiations and so on. And my pit peeve is actually Scrum. Why? Because what was promised was something like this. You know, everything gets nice and everybody works together and we are actually trying to achieve a common goal or at least, you know, to solve the problems that the customer asked us to solve. But what happened is that the customer sees it like this. I don't know, the light is a little bit too bright on this one, but you don't see the customer here, actually, you know, which is at the bottom of the scrum, and everybody trumps on him, and, uh, you know, and nobody understands the requirements anymore. Or, perfect. So now you see the customer, you see? He's here, suffering. And we as the developers, we are on top on him, you know? We try, instead of solving his problem, creating more. Or, as the developer sees it, you know, everything is muddy. We have our scrum master, he screams at us, he tells us what do we need to do, how do we need to solve that, and a lot of other discussions like, like this. So one of the things that I really appreciate about the cloud, and you know, looking lately at how people start to develop software and how, how the cloud can help us, is the fact that we can abstract away the infrastructure. This was our biggest problem from the very beginning. We have a production system and more or less we are locked into that. We need to make sure that our development system mimic the production system, our test environment mimic the production system, and everything is locked in. God forbid, you know, come with some idea of patching a production machine or doing something better because everybody is scared and nobody knows. Of course, we have another buzzword. I should have put that in the title as well, DevOps, you know, so maybe that, that would brought even more people to my session today. But one, no, uh, can you turn it off? Please? Oh, I, okay, got it. <laughs> yes. Back, the screen, you can turn it off, but please turn it on. 
Okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, doing, um, you know, looking at the way we are trying to do, uh, you know, and develop our applications, it, it becomes pretty, you know, pretty interesting to try to find an answer to the, you know, to the question, how do we update our production system? Or how do we treat our infrastructure as an artifact, as a part of what we are developing? So we shouldn't be, you know, locked into that. Uh, if you, I don't know, by a show of hands, how many of you are developers? Okay, so everyone. And I'm, how many of you have problems with IT department whenever they need a machine or something? How long, how long it takes until you get it? So if we look at, you know, let's see, we decided how, you know, what, uh, what our application needs to do. We start the development. So the very first thing we look at, you know, is how can we actually uh, provision a local network or, you know, some environment that we need for test, for whatever. The very first thing you'll do, you'll order the hardware. And of course, it has to go through procurement. It has to go through all the approvals. Your boss's boss needs to approve it. Or depending on the, you know, how big is your organization, you go all the way up to the CEO of the company for approval of, mach of a machine because you really need to, to do the testing. And most of the time, we got the machines, we put them in place, and what happens? We used them a couple of days. We did our tests. And then, yeah, maybe we remember about them in a month or two, and we use them again, and so on. Of course, when you get the hardware, that's only the first part. Then you have to go and speak with your IT pro department. They need to install it. They need to configure it. They need to start, to, to start actually setting up your network. And then after they set up the network, they need to set up the servers, put them in place, then install OS, patch it, and whatever, 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 and until, until you get the, the machine so you can start using it. When you got the machine, you install your application, and then you start configure it. So how long do you think it takes something like that? In an agile era, two weeks, three weeks, it's a lot of time. And I mean, I want to prove some theories. I want to try something out to make sure that whatever I'm, you know, I'm trying to solve this sprint, I'll be able to, to, to try it out. I want to be able to test it. I want to be able to even run it maybe against production data in, a, you know, in some kind of isolated environment. But because of all those problems, it's a bit difficult for us to, to, to realize that. So how do you do in the cloud? Well, regardless of what provider you choose, most of them have exactly the same kind of approach. The cloud at the end of the day is nothing more than just an abstraction. And you have three building blocks. That's, that's it. It's nothing more, nothing else. You have storage, you have network, you have compute. Those are the three building blocks that you would have. Of course, you can do all kinds of combinations. You can get all kinds of compute in your infrastructure. You can get a SQL server. You can get a the couch DB server, whatever, whatever you know you need, you can you can get there, and the operating system as well. So if I want to do something similar in the cloud, I would use the infrastructure. You know, I would have to configure the storage because I will need to save all the information somewhere on someone else's hard drives, and then I would need to configure my virtual network. It's still a network, but I still need to configure it. Then I have to deploy the virtual machine. Of course, it would be difficult for me to go with a DVD and put it somewhere because it's someone else's computer that I'm using. So I'm, I'm, I need to make sure you know, that I, I have a gallery or something like a library where I can, where I can get the, the necessary images. I need to configure something like a load balancer or whatever if I want to, you know, to really have a good uh, infrastructure, if I want to make sure that the infrastructure is actually uh, uh, it's stable. If I don't have any requirements for high, you know, high availability, then I can just go and do you know, one machine of each and then just test it. And I will assume that everything works, at least for the duration of my test. Then I will install the application. I will configure the applications. And this is actually something that can be done far more quicker. And just as a little demo, I've been doing a lot of um, a lot of customer engagement, even customers that said to us, you know what, we bought, uh, we bought a subscription from Microsoft and we want to use Azure, but we don't know how. So the very first thing they get, I'm afraid. What if I press something wrong? What if I start actually paying money for something that I really don't need or I don't know how to use? And Microsoft uses, you know, I don't know, how many of you are using SharePoint? Oh, good. Oh. My condolences, what can I say? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, um, you know, in my experience, I would just say SharePoint is one of the, um, you know, it's the worst ASP.NET application that was ever written. 
unfortunately, it's very used by a lot of people, and there's not, there's not much we can do about it, but, you know, uh, such is life. So if I go, you know, and try to do something, for instance, in my, uh, you know, in my Azure uh, portal, I just go to the portal itself, and then from the portal I'm, uh, let me do a refresh here. From the portal, I can choose what do I want to deploy, what do I want to create in my, uh, you know, in my virtual machine, in my virtual environment. So, what Microsoft uses, as you know, as the biggest demo ever, and when you want to show or impress a customer what is the bigger thing you could do, they just go here and say, I want to create something new, I want to create a new virtual machine, and then actually what I want to create, it a share, it's a SharePoint server farm. And they start the discussion, you know how much it takes, you know how to, you know, you need to do it in right order and everything needs to be done in right order. And if you don't keep your foot like this and your finger like this, your SharePoint server farm definitely won't work and you will have a problem. So we have the solution. You just go in here, now you press the button and you even tell me, do you want something to be high availability or do you want it to be, you know, just for your test environment? How do you want to deploy it? And when you do that, you know, it takes around two hours which is actually a very good improvement. It's still not very quick, but it's a very good improvement compared with what would you get if you want to do a, deploy a manual deployment of SharePoint. So ask any IT pro that has done that. You know, they'll do it once or twice and they will stop doing that because it's such, such a bloody experience, no one wants to do it. Another way to, you know, a simpler way to do it is just go here, do a compute, and I say, I want a new machine. Or I can look at the marketplace and I can choose some existing machines. At the, at the moment, oh, look, even that you get as a first thing here. You can do it, you know. <laughs> so uh, you get it in the very first page. You can choose whatever machine you want. They have a very big library of machines that you can just uh, create and deploy. Or if you go into the old portal, you can even access some of the machines that are specifically made for their MSDN subscribers. So if I want a machine with Visual Studio 2015, it takes me around five to 10 minutes to get it deployed and just start working on it. So if I look at my gallery here, I can choose whatever I want. I will say, give me the MSDN images. I will take a Visual Studio 2015 Enterprise Edition uh, running on the Windows 8.1. And then I say continue. I will give it a name, demo go to LDN what kind of machine I want, and based on how many, you know, how many horsepowers do I need in my machine, I can choose the one or the other. Uh, a user to access the machine. I think I need to learn how to spell my name. Password. And again, password. I think Microsoft doesn't like that <laughs> to come on. So that's something that they just added. Come on, two, three, four. Yes, two, three, four. Yes, now I got the new password. <laughs> so <laughs> it's password one, two, three, four, just so, so you know. I created the machine. It asked me if I want to add it into a cloud service. A cloud service is an abstraction layer, so I can, you can consider that as the rack where you installed your, your virtual machine. In there, you can configure your network. You can say which ports do you want to use, how do you want to use them. Um, if I want to have a DNS name, Normally, you want to have that, especially if you want to access that via, you know, via RDP and via internet. So you get actually an endpoint where you can connect from your local machine and access that um, via remote desktop. Uh, where do I want to place it? I would rather have it quite close so it's easier for me to access it. Availability set. If I want to have several machines that are complementing each other and I want to have something you know, like uh, high availability configuration, I need to configure that as well. But because this is my development machine, I don't, I don't care. Do I want to access remotely the machine via PowerShell? I would leave the PowerShell port open. If not, I just remove it. And then I say next. And then it will tell me what else do you want to do if you work with Puppet or Chef or, you know, if your machine has support for, for this kind, or do you want, in your configuration, need support for these kind of things, and you use like desired state configuration, that's a very neat way of doing it. And I press next, and then it will just start doing that. And it won't take long, everything will be done, you know, in like 10 minutes top, and I, I'm convinced that by the end of our, um, our session that would be done. 
Another way I've seen that used by Microsoft internally is whenever they come up with a new version of Visual Studio, if they want us to test it as MVPs, they give us a link. I activate the link, and that, the link will automatically provision a new machine for me. Because they are using shadow copy, it takes no more than 30 seconds to get the new machine provisioned for me to be able to use it. You can even use remote applications with Visual Studio. So there, there are a lot of things that you can do, and you can actually start being agile in a manner that you can create the stuff that you need. There are a lot of discussions, again, when you go and talk with the IT pro departments, because they are very scared now that you, know, you won't need them. Or you will, but not the way you used to need them before, that you go to them and they can block you for two weeks and not doing stuff for you. Now you even have access to do, the, to do those things. So what they can do, they can give you access, they can give you a quota and tell you how long, you know, how much money are you allowed to spend, for instance, so you won't go wild, you know, and then deploy a Hadoop cluster with 32 nodes that will, you know, <laughs> will actually uh, render the, the company broke. So you have, <coughs> you have this control. You can tell exactly what kind of services do they have access to. If you want, you can create the services for them and just give them access to the services so you, they don't have access to that. So you can still control that. Another very important point that a lot of people do not take into consideration is the fact that those machines can be turned off and on at any time. When you turn it off because you don't need it, what happens? You don't pay. You pay for the storage, but the storage is very cheap. You pay like a pound per month for, a, I don't know, for I don't know, 150 gigabytes or something like that. So if you create a machine and you, you keep it off for a whole month, you would owe Microsoft one pound for that. So it's not that much money anyway that you have to pay for doing that. But you know that as soon as I need something, if I want to turn it on, I just turn it on. Of course, if I want to uh, create a network, I can create a network. If I don't want those machines to be available on the internet, so I don't want to have any public ports open for, you know, for the machines, I can just create a virtual network and they have various solutions. Like I can, from my computer, connect into a network on the cloud and my computer will be part of a virtual network in the cloud and I can access all the machines that, you know, as would they be next to me. I know that one of my biggest problems as a developer is to get the database server up and running. I do a SQL Express or I do a SQL Local, but it's not really, you know, it's, it's, I'm not really happy about it all the time. So what I have to do instead, you know, is to create another virtual machine somewhere on, you know, on my own server at home, just to have a database, just to run some of the tests and see, oh, it's working, and completely forget about it. And then I have a bunch of VHDs that they're just, you know, growing and growing and growing, and I'm not doing anything with them. With this, I know, oh, I use the server, now I can turn it off. I can even create the databases straight into the cloud. I don't even need to have access to the, to the server itself. But this is a bit of a problem, the way I see it, at least. So let me go back to my presentation, which is this, which is this. I don't have any automation, or at least not so far. And without automation, this becomes a tedious process. You would have to always remember to put in some names, to put in some values, to put in some stuff. And again, you need to reconfigure all the stuff. So if I want to do with some automation, the way I would do it, I would look at what is, you know, that I, can, that I need to repeat. What exactly is it? If I look at my configuration right now, OK, so I have those two machines that they need names. They would need, you know, network interfaces. They would need a storage account. Uh, they would need. Uh, a virtual network because they, they need to communicate with each other. They would need a local database or a database server connected to the same virtual network and so on and so on. So I can do all of these, you know, I can look at them and try to identify them. When I identify them, I can use the build automation, different build automation processes to create that. Until now, the most common way was to do um, everything via PowerShell. So Microsoft had a very, let's say, imperative way of doing uh, all those deployments. But now they introduce something else that is called um, uh, Azure Resource Manager, which Azure Resource Manager is more a declarative way of creating your environment. And whenever someone asks me what's the difference between declarative and imperative, I used to, you know, I use my wife as an example. So if she asks me to go buy some milk, if she does it in an imperative way, she will tell me something like this. Go into the hallway, take your shoes, don't forget to, knight, you know, to knit your, yeah, your shoe, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> shoes. Then go downstairs, uh, turn right, go 200 meters, go inside Tesco, go, you know, back on the last row there, pick a box of milk, 
you know, go to the cashier, pay, come back, don't forget to take off your shoes, put it in the fridge, thank you. You know, ends with thank you. Which is a very imperative way of doing it, you know. It tells me every single step detailed like I would be, you know, my seven years old daughter. If she would use a declarative way of doing, she would just say, you know, or assertive, she would say we need milk, or declarative, she would say go buy milk. What's the advantage of the one and the other? The advantage of go buy milk versus, you know, go take your shoes and stuff like that. It's first, I know up front what she wants. Second, if she changes her mind, she doesn't have to, you know, go back the whole story and say, no, 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 wait, wait a second. You need to go into the hallway, and then when you get into the Tesco, you need to, to go there and end there. She will just say, go buy milk, go buy yogurt. And then I go and buy both of them. And, you know, in my mind, I can actually, I am able to do some optimization of the process. So I will be able to actually realize that I don't have to go twice to the Tesco to both buy the milk and the, the yogurt. I will do everything in one single step. And the same goes here. When you use a declarative approach to solve your problems, makes it easier for someone else to, you know, to read it, to understand it, because believe it or not, your code actually would, be, or whatever you are producing, you know, as an artifact, would be read far more many times than you are writing it. You know, especially if it's, the, you know, if you need uh, to to maintain it, and your code will run eventually. And of course, when you've done your configuration in a declarative or imperative manner, you need to execute it. And when you execute it, you get everything um, deployed. One other advantage with the um, Azure um, Resource Manager is that it uses something called desired state configuration. So it means what I want to do is I, I want to get into this state with my, you know, with my, uh, with my environment. Be it, you know, my production, my staging, my testing, uh, testing environment, whichever. I need to get to this state. So if I want to change something, it's smart enough to realize Oh, the state you are in right now is this machine, this machine, this machine, this machine. What would you, you would need to get to the desired state is to add this and this and configure this and that. And then just that did instead of uh, redeploying everything from the very beginning. If you have multiple environments, you can just parameterize that and then execute based on your parameters. And the nice part is that Microsoft actually offers now a whole gallery of stuff that you can run in the cloud, you know, using ARM. So if you look here, I can just go and say, oh, I would need a, you know, a start and template with some validation, and I will start from there, because I already need, I already know what I need to do. Or actually, you know what, I want to create a, the same thing that I'd done earlier with Visual Studio. I want to create it now as part of my deployment. So I will go and say, I want a Visual Studio Development VM. And this is the explanation. This is how it works. Everything is public in GitHub. You can just fork it, and you can change it as you wish. And when I'm done with it, I would just go here and say, deploy to Azure. What it does, it takes me straight into the portal. It gives me all the parameters that I have in my template, gives me a chance to fill in the parameters. And then when I press execute, it goes on and start executing all the stuff that I need to do. So let me see here. Where was it? Not this one, this one. So this one is still running and trying to provision. Let me put some parameters here. Demo, uh, STG. I want to use a standard um, storage. Again, I would use West Europe. VM name would be demo VS go to LDN. That's the virtual machine name. Um, the username, again, db. Now I need to put password 1234 as a password here, the size that, that I want, um, and what version I want. Again, I want 2015 Enterprise uh, with Azure SDK on Windows 8.1. And the DNS name, let me use the previous name from here. Which was it? This. Copy. Paste. Okay, so I need to press OK first. Yeah. 
yes, of course. Okay, I can create a new resource group. When you create a resource group, it's like a folder for your files. So every single artifact that you are creating, it would end up in this, in this folder. The biggest advantage with having a resource group is that when I'm done with it, I can just go and remove the whole resource group. I don't have to remember which storage I had you know, created, what was the name of the virtual machine, what was the name of the network, what was the name of the database. Everything would be in one resource group that I can, I can actually manage. I can even create, you know, give users permissions on the resource group level. I can say, okay, you get access to that resource group, meaning that he can get access to my virtual machines, he can get access to the, all the configurations and all the stuff that I was adding in there. So I don't have to go on each in each individual artifact, you know, like item in my configuration to create that. And the resource group would be demo RG uh, LDN. Create there is an error. Yes, I need to say that I'm OK with the conditions. It say buy, but it actually you are not buying anything. It's a little bit uh, misleading. And now it's starting to do the deployment. And again, it will take a while, maybe as long as it takes to do. Oh, this one is already done. So I can say connect now. It will give, it will give me an RDP file. I can use this RDP file and say connect. And I would say the username was TB and the password was password 1234. OK. Uh, I think it was password 1234. Remember my credentials, OK. Was only one, two, three? I think it's no, then it's the problem is this. TB. It looks at the Microsoft account and there is no Microsoft account called this. Uh, one, two, three, four. Okay. Yes, that's correct now. Now I have the virtual machine and it took 10 minutes. Hmm? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and then the other one will take us long. Now, if you want to do something a little bit more advanced, you always have Visual Studio. Go figure. So Microsoft created now a new type of project. So if we look at the cloud projects that we have available, it's one called Azure Resource Group. So part of my whole solution, part of my deployment, I can actually deploy now a whole resource group in this one. And what I get is actually a JSON file. And by the way, let me show you back here when we look at those starters, I have an Azure Deploy JSON file. And I promised yesterday that I would show some code on the screen. So this is it. It's not really in my PowerPoint presentation, but this is you know, as, as close as we get to coding in this session. Um, the version of the file, and then you know, what exactly parameters we have available, and then what I need to do. So my resources that I want to deploy First of all would be a storage name, and then I would have to have a virtual network with some properties uh, for that and some sub-networks if I want to create those. Uh, and then a network interface card, and after that I would have to create a virtual machine connected to that particular virtual network. And then I start the deployment. And it will do that, and it will create a public IP address. I've seen sometimes that when you try to do that, um, it fails because the IP address that tries to allocate sometimes cannot allocate it, and then you just have to re retry, and it will know, oh, this one was missing. Let me add it for you, and it, it will work. Uh, in Visual Studio, I can choose a resource group. Uh, of course, it's called Azure Resource Group 1. I am very inventive with the names. Let me see. And I, again, I'm moving quicker than my computer, and it doesn't like that. And I can choose some standard configuration, like I want a virtual machine to be created, or I want a uh, web application plus a, SQL, plus a SQL server, or and whatnot. So you can choose here. You have some elements in the gallery. You can, uh, in a later version, you would be able to populate your uh, you, the gallery with your own uh, with your own uh, templates there. And I have some scripts that, I'll, uh, that will be run. This is my, my, my PowerShell script. This is the one that will be used automatically to deploy the, uh, to deploy the resources into Azure. And the templates that I need um, to be able, in order to be able to uh, create application. 
So here gives me, it gives me all the information. It's exactly the same thing. Uh, they are working on a visualizer as well, so you can actually uh, create the layout of your infrastructure here inside Visual Studio, and it will generate a, a JSON behind the curtains, and it will put the, uh, when, when you say deploy, it will just do the deployment for you. So if I want now to deploy, I have a deploy option here. I haven't created yet any deployment. In order for me to be able to deploy, I need to configure my uh, information and say, where do I want to put the data? Let me take again the demo account. I can use an existing network group or I can uh, resource group and, or I can create a new one. Let's do create, create a new one. The name would be this. Why not? Uh, I want it automatically in West Europe. I would say create a resource group. Um, the template, the parameters, uh, the account name for storage would be demo vs stg. Uh, username again tb. Um, password would be password one two three four, and DNS name for public access would be. Let's do that. And then, what kind of visual of uh, Windows version do I want on that? Of course, this is the, the first step. You can take then the virtual machine, and then you can add, you know, uh, by by means of desired state configuration, you can add your own uh, your own uh, features of Windows. You can have your IIS. You can have whatever you need. You can add it there. I can say save, and then I will say deploy. It will try to deploy it, and when it's deployed, I can go into the um, uh, into uh, into that. That is for the following parameter. Yes, I forgot to press save password. So now it starts to create a deployment package, send it to, uh, to Azure, and then it will do the deployment. And then when everything is done, I will see inside my Visual Studio exactly what I had to do and what it did. And it gives me the output, and then I can, I can follow this. OK? So the other one. This one. Still there. Questions? What do you think about it? How does it look? Not as scary as it was at the beginning, or, <laughs> or I don't know. I usually when I when I speak with customers and I show them that they say, "Oh, it was that easy." Yes, it is that easy. It's not as as scary as it seems. And if I can create three virtual machines in less than 40 minutes, 35 minutes of presentation, you know, and talk at the same time, I don't know if it's multitasking or it's really something that can be used. You know, when when you really need agility, when you are able to actually adapt to change. Okay. Remember to rate the session. I told you the green button, you know. Uh, and thank you. Questions, Dan? Fantastic. Thanks, Debbie. Thank you. Oh, can we have number two? Thanks, Thanks Debbie. Uh, so there's three questions. One of the questions is just one word. So I'll just read out the whole question. Testing. Of what? <laughs> So it's the testing environment, or is the testing of, of your um, of your infrastructure? How do you test your production infrastructure today? Your hardware? How do you test it today? Do you have any? I mean, I don't know who asked the question, but how do you test it today? Silence. <laughs> I think a lot of people don't, right? No. Or, or at least the people in this room don't, because Pix is in a data center do all that and we hope that it's all working Yes. or something. So if you look at, I mean, one of the things that I like to tell people is if you decide to take a dependency on, you know, on something bigger like AWS or Azure or whatever cloud provider and they promise you a certain level of agreement, I think you can pretty much sleep better at night just because, you know, it's something in place. Of course, you can be as paranoid as you want, and then you would be able to get the six ninths if you want the six ninth. But then the, the question is, is it worth it, cost-wise? Will it be worth it for you to have this or not? And then Microsoft, for instance, at, at least in the, on the Azure side, they have a lot of um, a lot of uh, solutions for these kind of uh, scenarios. 
Fantastic. Um, so I think actually another, another thing that occurred to me while why, why you're answering that is one of the things that this sort of move does is it brings me as a developer much closer to having to think about testing my infrastructure. Yes. Which is a thing I haven't really had to think about before. So what advice can you give me for how to start reasoning about that? So, I mean, one of the ways they do test the infrastructure physically is that someone goes in and pull the plug on the network or, you know, pull the, the, the plug on the, on, the whole, on the whole machine. You can do something similar in the cloud. You have actually the possibility to stop a, a machine and it will just stop it without saving any states or asking you, do, are you really sure you want to do that, you know, hundreds of times. So you can test something similar and see what would happen with my system in case of that. And there are, you know, one of the things I really like about the way Microsoft took Azure uh, um, is that they were trying to solve the hardest distributed computing problem. So they didn't go and say, oh, we have a bunch of machines in our data centers that we are not using. Please come and, and use them, you know, and pay us some, some money. They were looking, first of all, what is, you know, what is hard today when you create a distributed computing, you know, environment. And from that, they grew actually into offering virtual machines. So virtual machines came like two years after they start offering, you know, cloud solutions. Uh, for two reasons. One, because they found a very good uh, appealing solution, and two, because the customers were asking. Microsoft is more customer oriented than, than ever. They listen to the customers more, more than anyone would be uh, you know, willing to admit. But they are, they are actually doing a lot of stuff like that. So you have possibilities. You can do this kind of testing, of course. Um, but some of them, you know, it, it has to do actually with you know, the re resilience of your system or the anti-fragility of your system. In the fridge, did you put the shoes or the milk in the fridge? <laughs> there was a specification problem. So, no, because it was imp imperative, you know. My wife told me exactly what I have to put in the fridge. So, you know, the fact that I didn't repeat it correctly is my problem. It's not, you know, so it wasn't, it wasn't her. <laughs> so, it was a, yeah, it was a specification error, excellent. Okay, yeah. Um, so, so the other, the other one word um, question I have is security, question mark. So, how many that's, of you... That's, that's the whole other track going on. Yeah, I know, I know. And I know who asked <laughs> the question. I know, I know who asked the question. Two minute answer. Two minute answer. Okay. Um, so, everybody talks about security and everybody says, oh, if you put everything in the cloud, that's a very big no-no because of the security problems you, you might have. Microsoft actually does a lot of, a lot of stuff for, specifically for that not only Microsoft, all the cloud providers. And I would actually, um, I can actually say that I think they're, they're one of the best secured environment that you would ever get. So as soon as, you know, if you believe that what they do is secure and you try to secure your application, you would be all, all set. But now the, the, the other question is how many of you as developers, because every, almost all of you raised their hands when we were talking about, you know, who you are, are thinking about security when they are developing applications. Yeah, uh, yeah, two, three. <laughs> exactly Both what I you. thought. <laughs> I I always have the same, you know, the same problem. I'm going and uh, in speaking with customers, and the, the 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 answer I get, oh, that's not our problem. You know, it's the IT department that needs to to fix that. And the question is how. I mean, if you go to them and tell them they need to fix your security, the only thing they know to do for you is to open port 80, and then you end up, uh, you know, having HTTP, the only thing, single protocol that is allowed in every single organization around the world, or HTTPS, because they heard that you know can can be more secure if you use HTTPS. But those are the only two protocols, and most of the times, you as a developer, if you don't understand the implications of the, the technology you are using and the security implications of that. Then I think it's you know it's more of our problem than the IT pro guys' problem. Yeah. In my personal opinion, couldn't agree more. Um, and we have, okay, this is interesting. So how about deploying boilerplates and full stack applications, so template applications, MV star star type things in Azure? So one of the things that uh, I don't know if I, I know I, I moved too quick, uh, but exactly above my MSDN checkbox was my disks and, and my images. So you can actually take a machine, you can do the whole configuration how you need it, and then you can save the image and then you can replicate it, create, uh, replicate the, the, the image and create exactly a new, a new machine. If you want to do a complete environment, there is another interesting thing that you could do here. Let me show you. Uh, you have an ARM Explorer. So you can actually look at whatever you have deployed in Azure, 
You can look at it as an, um, as an ARM template, Azure Resource Manager template, and you can take that particular template, change the parameters as you want, you know, the name and the network and maybe the IP addresses and stuff like that, and then just redeploy it. And then you don't have to go, you know, click all the buttons, write all the names, you know, in different text boxes and so on. You can just recreate that and you can read an existing uh, ARM template to do that. Fantastic. And then one, one more quick question. So I'm, I'm very new at this whole cloud thing. Um, you've told me how easy it is to create instances, spin up instances, clone instances, and all that. When? How do I know that I need another instance of a thing? Um, two, two ways. One is you wait for the customers to call and tell you that just really yeah, slow. It's, it's crap. <laughs> or actually, there is something called auto scaling. Both offer that, you know, and you can base your auto scaling either on the you know CP CPU load, uh, time of day, or memory load, and so on. So based on you know based on various parameters, you can configure your your, um, your auto scale. So you say, okay, if I have a load over 80% for more than one minute or two minutes, please spin up a new machine. And it will do an identical machine. Of course, the whole stateless discussion is a different one, but it will spin up a, new, a completely new machine that would do exactly the same as the original one, and then it will just you know, help with, uh, with uh, you know, serving the request and uh, what, uh, whatever you need. And it load balances across those? Or? Yes, you can choose the kind of load balancing you want. If you want, you know, if you want round robbing, if you want based on the load, or you know, so it, uh, if uh, it, I'm not sure if you can even do stickiness in, in you know, like the session stickiness at, at some point, but um, you you can do that. So it does that automatically. So you don't have to you don't have to do it. It's not your uh, how to say your explicit uh, responsibility to, to do it, which is which is very good. You really want the automation. Another way to automate things is, you know, as I said, you can look at, at hours and say, okay, you know what, I know that um, 9 a.m. every morning we need to do, you know, uh, all the sales guys are coming in and they are running our sales, you know, uh, but they, they go to Salesforce and they run the reports and then I really need, you know, I don't want them to wait for one hour to get the report. So between 9 and 9.30, because I would actually, it will take far more uh, longer, uh, far, far more less time, I would say, you know what, spin three more machines. So instead of, you know, taking a lot of time to do one report, I know for the, you know, for the half an hour I'll have four machines and everybody will get their reports far quicker. You can even shut down your machine. So if I have a test environment that I know, you know, or my development environment I know that I'm using during the day, I can actually go and configure it and say, you know what, every single evening at 7 p.m. please turn it off. In the morning at 8.30 turn it on. So by 9 when I'm there, it's already started. I don't have to wait for it to, to, to get started and so on. Oh, cool, fantastic. And uh, very briefly then, because then these guys can get a coffee ahead of the, the next <laughs> session. Uh, um, the, so all looks super easy to use. How do you think it compares in terms of ease of use to something like Amazon? Um, I think that's that's the battle that you know they they, they have they, they will start fighting now because the ease of use is the most uh, you know is the most appealing at the end of the day. They, if you really want to compare, you know, in terms of what they are offering, they are pretty close to each other. Of course, there are some you know people have some preferences. They would go with Amazon if they they come from a Linux background because they know that Microsoft is not you know is not really although <laughs> that's not true anymore. Uh, and if you work with Windows, most people would tend to go to Microsoft, although we have big customers as well that are going with Amazon. We have actually customers that require both of them, so they want to abstract even the cloud away, you know, the cloud provider. They say, we don't want to take dependency on one single cloud provider. We want to use both of them, you know, for various scenarios, like disaster recovery being one of them, you know, like the, the, the single most used uh, uh, case for that. Cool, fantastic. Thanks very much, Tibby. Thank you. <laughs>